Welcome back to This Is Working. When we started this show pre-pandemic, the idea was to talk to people who have an outsized impact on our professional world. Now, and I don't need to tell any of you this, the world is having an outsized impact on us. So every week we bring on leaders who are trying to figure out how to steer through this crisis, whose voice or actions or legislation leads to jobs, income, investment, and who can help all of us see around corners as much as they can. Uh, I'm very thrilled to have with us today Airbnb co-founder Brian Chesky. Brian, welcome to LinkedIn Live, and this is working. It is great to uh, to see you here. Where, where, where do we have you, by the way? Where are you recording from? In San Francisco, and this is uh, this is kind of my office where I work. That's great. It's beautiful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was just saying before we went on air, it's so you know it's very on brand to have an incredibly beautiful uh, space to work at. That's, that feels very Airbnb. I'm stuck. You know, well, I, I, this was my space. It wasn't yeah. as dressed up, and I started realizing if I'm the founder of Airbnb, encouraging hosts to you know show off their places, my place better be pretty decent as well. So that's right. You got a lot to live up live exactly. up to. Uh, I want to cover a number of things in our talk today, and we're going to be taking questions from the stream. So uh, if you are watching this, please make sure you leave your questions in the comments and we'll get a, a chance to ask those to, uh, to Brian. I um, want to talk about how you're steering, steering Airbnb through this crisis, what you think the world of travel is going to look like when we come out of it. Um, but I'd love to start first with some questions about the Airbnb economy. When you created this uh in the financial crisis, this this sort of economy didn't exist before, at least not at this scale. You uh, hosts have earned more than eighty billion dollars from renting rooms. Just reading off some numbers, fifty percent rely on Airbnb to help them stay in their homes and, in many cases, avoid foreclosure. Sixty percent hire someone to help them with their listings. Twenty percent are over sixty years old, and many of those people are on fixed incomes. When you tie all this together, you've helped build an economy that has now been shuttered because of the coronavirus pandemic. I know you're doing a lot of listening sessions. I would love to understand what you're hearing from hosts right now, and especially now that we're kind of a month into this. What are they saying? What kind of pain are they feeling? How are you walking them through it? Because this is now a livelihood. It's not just a pastime. Yeah, it, Airbnb started about 12 years ago, and it started in a different kind of crisis. It was 2008. And I was living with my roommate, Joe, in San Francisco, and we couldn't even afford to pay rent. And Airbnb was really a way for us to be able to rent our own homes. We were going to create a bed and breakfast. We didn't have any beds. Joe had three air beds. We pulled the air beds out of the closet. We called it air bed and breakfast. We were the first host on Airbnb. And back then, we remember hearing people saying um, that they were worried about losing their homes. And in fact, the reason Airbnb really started was because people needed to be able to make rent or be able to pay their mortgage. And so they turned to Airbnb as a way to monetize the space they had. And in the last 12 years, um, hosts have earned about $100 billion, um, about 4 million hosts. And I'm incredibly proud that more than half of those hosts are women. Um, and um, you know, in the United States, um, more than one in 10 of our hosts are school teachers or in a household of school teachers. So this has been something that millions of people depended on you know about a month ago a couple months ago this crisis hit and there are so many of our hosts 50 percent of our hosts tell us that they depend on Airbnb to pay their rent or their mortgage and when this crisis hit i mean it just felt like i was a captain of the ship and a torpedo hit the side of the ship and everything started breaking at once and the one of the first things we started doing I started doing uh, listening sessions with hosts. We did over a hundred listening sessions. And I would say that the things we're hearing now are the same things I heard 12 years ago. Uh, people are concerned, they're afraid, they want information. Um, they really are worried about how they're gonna be able to make their rent, pay their mortgage. And you've got a range of people from people that have dedicated properties, but the vast majority of people really rely on this as supplemental income. And so their use cases vary, but the, the, the concern is very, very present. And we're gonna try to do everything we can to be with them every step of the way. And what I told them is this is a storm. And like all storms, no matter how bad it gets, we're gonna to have to know that it will end. You know, Winston Churchill is saying, if you're going through hell, don't stop, just keep going. And we're gonna to have to just keep going with them every single week, one week at the other. And hopefully on the other side, you know, we'll be able to, we'll be able to really support them. 
Yeah, I mean, I guess the difference, though, is that 12 years ago when you started this, you were the savior. You were the ones who provided people with that answer of how we're going to get through this. Now they have been relying on you. They're, they count on Airbnb to get through this. I'm just curious, are, are people, are they looking for other sources of income? Are you finding the listings are, yeah. are dropping? Or are they sticking with it and saying, we're oh, no, uh, yeah. So um, we've, we've not seen any noticeable drop off in host on Airbnb. And in fact, deactivations are down from a year ago. So they're they're down from where they thought they would be. 92% uh, of hosts say they're gonna be more likely to host when this is over than before it started. And so I think people are seeing this as an economic lifeline. Now in these listening sessions, hosts are asking a number of things. The first thing they said is half of them were not totally comfortable um, hosting for health and safety reasons. So we brought on the former Surgeon General of the United States, Dr. Vivek Murthy, and he is working with us to provide some COVID-19 cleanliness standard guidelines for our hosts so they can keep themselves and their guests safe. The next thing we did is we started listening to hosts and they started telling us different ways they would like to host and earn income. I'll give you a couple examples. A number of hosts said to us, you know, we're getting a lot of inquiries for people that want to stay for more than a month. And I started thinking about this. There are no really big marketplaces on the internet for people that need a home for more than a month. And the longer you stay, kind of the more important the marketplace is to be able to support you. And so we adapted our website immediately. We created a monthly tab business. And now uh, nearly half of our business by room nights are for stays longer than a month. And this makes complete sense because as people are sheltering in place, they're starting to realize if I'm working from home, why can't I just work from anywhere? And so we're starting to see a complete expansion of how Airbnb started. If we have 7 million homes and we have as many as we had before the storm and more people need extended stays, then they're gonna come to Airbnb. And though that, that's been a thing that we've done to be able to modify to help them get monthly discounts to be able to do that. Another thing we had is we have an experiences business. And we had to, for social distancing reasons, stop our experiences business. And then in listening sessions, host said, we love to offer experiences. We used to have three hour activities. And they said, we'd love to offer a shorter version of it online. We can even do it over Zoom. And so we thought, okay, like at first it seemed a little crazy, but then we thought a one hour experience, we'll try it. And so we launched online experiences a couple weeks ago. Online experiences are now the fastest growing product we've ever launched. Like, and what's so an example of that? So we have, I'll give you a couple examples. We have a Cirque du Soleil, uh, uh, Cirque du Soleil they laid off 95% of their employees um, and or, or furloughed, and so they're not performing. And a Cirque du Soleil, one of the performers can do a performance to like a group of five or 10 people. We have a host in Ukraine, in Chernobyl, where the nuclear meltdown occurred, who does a tour in Chernobyl, where you kind of see all of the uh, remnants of the disaster, and there's uh, hundreds of stray dogs. They call it the dogs of Chernobyl. It's like walking in a documentary. We have baking classes for kids, and we have a lot of uh, we have over a dozen Olympic athletes that were preparing for the Olympics in July in Tokyo. We were a sponsor for the Olympics, and they decided to do basically like workouts or uh, goal setting classes. And these are all one hour. You can do them online, and it's a pretty crazy thing. There's something about a crisis where I think the way your mentality, the way you think about it determines your fate. If you see the crisis is the worst thing that ever happened to you, it probably is. And then suddenly you'll be a victim. But I also always believe that a crisis can be an opportunity. It can be opportunity to like make a pivot, define yourself, diversify. And that's what we've tried to do every step of the way. Uh, we are live here with Brian Chesky, the CEO of Airbnb. Um, Brian, I want to get to start getting. I want to get to some questions from uh, from LinkedIn members in a second. When you talk about taking advantage or thinking how you're going to manage through a crisis, uh, if for the last eight nine years you've been through an expansion and it has yeah. just been about grow and take market share, how do you make that change of saying, "All right, we're in we're in crisis mode"? What were those initial? conversations like with your senior executives? What did you tell them you wanted to hear from them? How did you move them from expansion footing to crisis footing? Well, I'm not, a uh, crisis is not new to Airbnb. We were literally born in a crisis and we've had our share of crisis over the last 12 years. But this crisis was unlike anything I've ever experienced. Because usually when you have a crisis, your crisis is one thing and you got to, you fix it. And in this crisis, it felt like everything broke at once. 
before the crisis, I was literally working on our S1 document to go public. And again, it felt like, you know, if you were in a ship, boom, all of a sudden started rattling. And the first thing we noticed were, um, you, you know, I'll back up. It's really important having been through crisis before that you take a very principled approach to crisis. I wrote out a bunch of principles about how we want to handle this crisis. The first thing I said is we have to be decisive. Speed is going to be of the essence. People are, 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 are waiting for us. And so that means we're going to have to be in constant communication. The second thing is we're going to have to consider all of our stakeholders. And I wrote down all of our stakeholders and what all their needs were. And we we're going to look at that every single day. We created a daily worm stand up. And the last thing I said is we want to be remembered for how we handled this crisis. We're not going to make every decision right, but we're going to make principled decisions. And in a crisis, I learned the hard way that you have a choice. You can make a principal decision or a business decision. And a business decision I would define as the decision that you make um, to maximize a certain outcome. Mm -hmm. A principal decision is a kind of decision you make where you say, I, the world is changing so fast. I don't know what's going to happen. How, regardless of the outcome, how do I want to be remembered? And this immediately uh, would tested us into action. The first thing that happened where we started getting cancellations from guests, we had over a billion dollars, which of cancellations from guests. Now, remember, guests prepay us. We hold the money. What do you do? Hosts wanted 100 percent of their money. Guests wanted 100 percent of their money. I didn't want to have to take a side between the guests and the hosts. We chose to take the side of health and safety. And I did not want to have a moral conflict where, you know, guests were felt like they were compelled to travel because they couldn't get their money back. So then we refunded all the guests. But this created a huge economic shortfall for our host. It was a huge problem. And we started doing listening sessions and we saw that, you know, they needed uh, income. And so we decided to take two hundred and fifty million dollars of our own money and give it just straight up, give it to our hosts to make up for a percentage of uh, what they would have been due per their cancellation policy. Our employees heard this and they decided to donate a million dollars of their own money. Jonay and I, my co-founders and I decided let's double down, let's add a zero. So then we put in $9 million of our own money. We created a super host relief fund. Eventually it grew to $17 million and we've been giving grants up to $5,000 per host. While we're doing the listening sessions, we started learning that hosts wanted other ways to make money. They told us about online experiences. We built that in 14 days, launched it. They told us they want to do longer stays. We did monthly stays. We updated our entire website, our homepage. We optimized it for stays nearby. And then we had to optimize for our shareholders. And so I had to basically work with our team to cut $800 million of marketing expense. We had to renegotiate contracts with our vendors. We had to you know, ramp down work with our contingent workers. We had to go step by step and cutting costs was not enough. So we ended up raising money. And in two weeks while doing everything I said, we also raised $2 billion. And if that wasn't enough, we also had to maintain a close relationship with our employees. I do a weekly Q and A every week from the office. I had to start doing it from this home and I didn't have a lot of answers. And an instinct is in a crisis, if you don't have the answers, don't be out there. But I said, I'm not going to hide. No matter how hard it is, no matter how bad it gets, I'm going to look our, every one of our employees in the eye. I'm going to tell them how bad it is. I'm going to tell them what I do and don't know. And I've been on that journey with them every single Thursday for the last six weeks. And this has just been a bit of the journey. It's been you know, one of the hardest six weeks of my life. I think that's not, I'm not unique. I think that we are all in a broader sense going through something that's unprecedented. Um, and I will tell you that running a company rooted in travel, whose mission is to bring people together, um, well, a lot of things go wrong in a pandemic. Right. Well, um, I think that the amount that you're putting, oh. people have noticed the amount you're putting into this and the amount you're coming, you're out there and saying what you know and what you don't know. Um, there are a lot of questions we're getting on the stream about the future of your business. Uh, a big one comes from Thomas, is, which is how will the travel industry be impacted and how will this affect your business model? Do you expect right. to have the monthly stays continue to be a, a large part of your business? Is that, for, is that forever? Is that for the future? Or is that a temporary thing? And how many people will still travel to dense cities or they, do you expect them to start going to smaller cities? Yeah. So what I would say about the travel industry is the following. The travel industry is people often don't realize this. 
the travel industry is one of the largest industries in the world. One in 10 jobs in the world are travel, hospitality, entertainment. And it just to give you some numbers in 1950, 25 million people crossed the border to travel. And last year it was like 1.3 billion. So it's a massive industry. And what I would say is the following, no matter how bad the storm is, no matter how long travels and paused, travel will return and will probably be bigger than it ever has been before. Um, travels lived through the Great Depression. Travel has lived through World War II. Um, and so it will absolutely return. And the reason it's going to return is because we all have a fundamental human desire to explore. We're hunter-gatherers. Uh, that's how we evolved. And so we have this inner urge to travel, and I don't think that's ever going away. But the way we're traveling, I think, is going to forever change. And I think the travel industry as we knew it and the way we traveled as we knew it is 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 going to completely change. I think old travel, you know, people planned long in advance. It was, um, you know, it was, um, you know, more about going to big urban markets where you stayed in kind of tourist districts and you kind of went to landmarks and checked things off a box. A lot of travel was for business conventions and conferences. I think the whole world is about to change. It clearly is changing. And I think the future travel is going to look quite different. I think number one, people are going to certainly care about health and safety. So that's going to be a critical consideration. When travel resumes, it's going to start nearby. I actually think a lot of people are going to resume traveling, but they're not going to get on an airplane right away. They're going to get in a car. And when they get in a car, they're not going to go to big urban areas to start. Uh, leisure travel is going to resume before business travel. This is indisputed uh, by the undisputed by most leaders in travel. And I think what's going to happen is they're going to go to more remote areas. So they're going to go to small towns, remote areas. So San Francisco, people are going to go to small towns and disperse outside of those areas. And that's going to be how it's going to start. Additionally, I think that we were starting to live through, a, we're going to be, we're basically taking a multi-decade revolution in how we're going to live. And it's going to be, it's being condensed into weeks. There are, you know, the, the, there's an old saying that there are like, decades, nothing happens, a week's decade happens, decades happen, that's happening in travel. And so I think we're all realizing we can work from home and you can get a lot of work done on Zoom. I'm not sure everyone wants to only work from home and only be on Zoom, but I think you're gonna see a lot more remote working. And the moment you start seeing more remote working, a whole bunch of people are gonna say, "Can I? should I really live in this city? I might wanna live somewhere else. And other people are gonna say, I actually would like to live in different places. And so your office can be in your laptop and it can be traveling around. So I think that people are going to be less tethered to one city. And this is something I always thought was going to happen, but I thought it would happen over 20 years. Mm -hmm. And now it's happening over months, not even decades. And so I think fundamentally, you're going to see a whole generation of people not rooted. Additionally, because we're entering an economic recession, possibly even a depression with unemployment in double digits, possibly for more than a year, what you're going to see is a major re-emphasis on affordable travel. Airbnb partially grew because it was a recession and people needed money and travelers need to save money. And Airbnb was originally adopted by people my age. When I started, I was 26. I was what we call the millennial. Well, there's a new 26 year old called Gen Z, and that is going to be the new future of travel. And so I think you're going to start to see travel that's smaller, more intimate, fewer lines, more human connection, because I think right now the world's paused. Things are still. And in this stillness, I think we're realizing we didn't need everything we thought we needed. But there are some things that I think that we are realizing we need more than ever. And I think if there's one thing that we need more than ever, that this has been a reminder of, it's, it's, it's our need to connect. And you often don't value something until you've lost it. And I feel like this has been, in some ways, at least physically, the most physically lonely period of my life, living in a home mostly alone and not seeing a lot of people. And I'm sure a lot of people can identify with this. But in a larger sense, I value relationships more than I ever have before. And I think that idea of connection, it's, it's going to come back in real life. And so we might work on Zoom. But when we choose travel, I think it's going to resume. I think it's going to be in the physical world because people are going to really have that yearning for connection, but it may not look like it did in the past.
Yeah, we've gotten we've seen a lot of comments from people saying something similar. Marisa Sierra says, as a super host, we missed our guests and meeting new people from around the world. So echoing exactly what you're saying, Brian. Um, thanks for all you do. She says, Deandra says, going on a staycation is always an option. I think they're underestimated. Sometimes just getting out of your house does a lot. All of that points to what you're talking about is a is a decade's worth of change to the travel industry happening within weeks. It's going to have a huge impact on jobs. It means that you talked about 10% of the um, uh, of jobs or travel industry jobs. Uh, those jobs might stay, but it sounds like they are going to change in what you do and who you work for and where those jobs are. So huge impacts. I'm curious, and this one this is a great question from Charles Liu, which is, do you think this disaster will cause cities to ease back some of the restrictions that they're trying to implement on Airbnb hosts? <clears throat> you know, one of our principles has always been um, that I want us to be good for cities and contribute to cities. And we've not gotten it right all the time because when I started Airbnb, the 2007, 2008, the culture of the internet is that, you know, kind of we're platforms and um, the internet's kind of like an immune system. And if you build really good tools and flagging systems and reviews, it will kind of sort itself out. And so we all kind of took a little more hands-off approaches. This is the culture that was Craigslist, eBay, Pierre Midiar, Craig Newmar, many of the kind of pioneers of community marketplaces. And I think we learned the hard way, I certainly did, over the course of 10 years, that we have to take more responsibility for the activity that happens on our platform. And we have been basically trying to play catch up. If there's a silver lining, um, there are always are silver linings in crisis. Um, one of them is I do think we have a bit of a reset on our relationship with cities because we have fewer guests in those cities. And I think people are now going to see what cities are like without the guest. And I think that it's an opportunity for us to renew our relationship. One of the things I did and I said should be a first principle, as I said, we might be smaller right now. We no longer have 2 million people a night staying in Airbnbs, but in this crisis, we can be useful and we'll find a way to be useful. And the opportunity happened not long ago when we started realizing that people, health frontline workers, nurses, doctors, firefighters, and EMTs needed housing. Either they were going to a new town to treat people, hotels were closed, or they just didn't want to stay with their family at risk of getting them sick and they need housing. And one of the things we started doing is we reached out to cities to say, we'd like to be useful. In fact, some cities reached out to us. And so we made a commitment to try to house 100,000 frontline workers. We decided to put our money where our mouth is. I put in my own $5 million of my own money to do this. And the company put in money to provide free or subsidized housing for these guests. And I think this has been just a, 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 it's been a new, it's been wonderful to work with them on the same side of the table to solve a problem together. And if I, I, I felt the, great partnership with cities. And I do think that, you know, we want to be partners. And I do think if this is anything, it's a reset and the partnership and the relationship with some cities around the world. And we just want to be there to help them. So nothing concrete yet in terms of changes in laws or or zoning restrictions or anything around taxes? I think, I, I, think, I mean, I, I think that everyone's just so focused on getting through the crisis right now. I think what I've noticed is people went from year to year planning to month to month planning to now week to week. And most cities I'm working with are only thinking about how they're going to get to next week. Yep. And uh, I think that's kind of how the world is now. We're like starting to live week to week because weeks feel like decades. And I, that's totally understandable. So, but I, I do think that the nature of travel is changing and, um, you know, it's kind of scary when travel stops and that's nearly 10% of the world economy, you know, it's 5% to 10%, depending upon how you, how you measure it. Um, there are entire countries, you go to the Caribbean, there are entire countries who depend on the tourism economy, um, to survive, you know, there's, these are entire economies. So I think this is a major story. And I think this, this, the, the wrath of this pandemic from an economic standpoint does not solely target travel, but travel is the tip of the spear. So uh, right. I think Huge that we're all, we're all in this together and yep. uh, you know, we're just going to try to help each other. Well, you talked a little bit about what you're doing for frontline workers. We got a note from Bridget who said Airbnb works with Fisher House to provide no cost housing for family, for military families and veterans and medical crisis. I'm grateful for companies like this. So nice, oh, that's nice shout out. And Roshni says, the one thing that keeps me going is dreaming of traveling somewhere once things settle down. So a lot of demand. Yeah, I think it's travel. wonderful. It's, it's useful to imagine 
you may or may not be comfortable when this is all over getting on an airplane and crossing a border and going to a foreign uh, city immediately. You might want to, you kind of like, it's kind of like baby steps. You're not going to like cannonball into a pool, but you know, imagine uh, how, what our inclination is going to be to want to stay in our homes the entire summer. If we have to do something, we will for the sake of health. But I think if people can get the opportunity to go out, I don't think they should be obviously congregating in large dense areas, but I do think people are going to want to go outside. I think they're going to want to leave their house. And I feel like the world before COVID almost feels like a dream. I think about trips I was on and I don't know, I've been in this house so long. It doesn't, it almost doesn't even feel like real life anymore. It feels like a dream that faintly is in the back of my memory. And I'm just looking forward to revisiting that. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the uh, super fund, the, the, ho the, the fund that you set up for super hosts yeah. and the emergency fund? How are those payouts being given? We've had a lot of questions that come in when hosts asking when they should expect to see those payments and how they're being processed. So there's two different funds. There's a $250 million fund and there's a $17 million fund. The $250 million fund is paying out hosts a portion of their cancellation policy. Those funds, a hundred, it's $250 million. Oh, um, probably uh, probably 20 or 30 million has been paid out. 140 million of the 250 million will have been paid out by this Friday. And then there's gonna be payouts, you know, kind of on a weekly basis to get through over the coming uh, few weeks to disperse the remainder of uh, the majority of that 250 million. On the Superhost Relief Fund, these are purely grants. These are need-based grants. We invite you, you give an application, and we give you a grant of up to $5,000. You don't have to pay it back, it's just, just a gift. And we've sent out 4,000 applications, and I believe in the next, probably by mid-May, we'll send out the last applications. And there's a two-week window between the time you fill out the application and our commitment to giving you the grant. Now, I also say this fund started at 10 million. It went up to 17. Um, I have nothing to announce yet except to say that everything we announce for host aren't the only things we'll ever do. And I am super committed to continue to do more and more for host week by week, month by month. And as soon as we can do more, we will. Great. Uh, for those tuning in, we've got Brian Chesky here for the uh, co-founder and the CEO of Airbnb. Um, thank you for everyone for bringing in your questions. We're going to wrap it up here in a minute. I'm just curious, uh, Brian, question that comes in from Julian, really looking into the future. What are your ex expectations for occupancy uh, in 2021. And I don't know if you can even see this far, but are you thinking about 2022 yet? It's a, it's a great question. Um, so let me preface by saying, I don't know. And I don't think anyone in the world could confidently tell you what the world's going to look like next year. I do think, um, most, um, forecasters, um, in travel and hospitality are forecasting a recovery by, um, somewhere around 2022. Um, I think that what many people are saying is that 2021 will be close to as large as last year. Um, I've seen pessimistic forecasts saying it won't return to 2023. I've seen optimistic forecasts saying people believe it will return by next year. Within that range is going to be a, a range of outcomes. Um, I do think for certain use cases, it could actually return very quickly and surpass. For example, if somebody lives outside of a city, if they've got a, like, let's say they're Airbnb host and they live outside a city, um, given the mixed shift in travel um, to non-urban areas, I think they will see recovery much sooner and they could even see a recovery that could be greater than the old trajectory. I think um, people who are willing to host people for longer lengths of time, they also could see recovery much sooner and it could be much greater than the trajectory. For people um, living in incredibly dense areas that um, that have been ho hosting business travelers historically, that would be an example of something that I think will take longer to recover. And we just can't forecast it. I do believe that the convention business and the conference business, that's basically mostly wiped out for this year. Many people have already canceled their business in convention. So the business travel is going to take a bit of time to recover, and they're already canceling a lot of events and conferences. So you know, you're going to, you're going to see it start, you're going to see it recovering um, next year for sure. Um, but some people are going to see recovery much sooner, but it's going to be a different kind of travel, not the old kind of travel. Yep. 
Uh, one last question for you, Brian. You have a beautiful office in San Francisco. I've seen pictures of it. Uh, how is your office going to change when you start opening back up again? Well, yeah. I mean, the first question is when do we open? Um, I don't know. We we certainly won't be in the office before June 1st, but then again, we're sheltered in place here in San Francisco until June. So it's unclear when we'll return. And when we return, I think the return is going to be gradual. And I think people are realizing two things. Number one, there's a real value to human connection. There's a reason why um, real life still matters. And we want to connect. At the same time, I think we're realizing you can get a lot done over uh, remote work. And so I think that um, we're still going to return to an office, but I think it's going to be gradual. We'll probably have a lot more flexibility um, to be able to work and to live. And, um, you know, I, I would just say, um, you know, when people do return, I'm really, really looking forward to starting this next chapter because there's something, I don't know, there's something about a crisis. Um, you know, when I was a kid, my dad used to tell me um, things are never quite as good as they seem or as bad as they seem. And I think they seem really bad now. They might get worse, but I do think they're going to return to a new normal. And in that new normal, for me, I've been doing a lot of reflection about, um, you know, a crisis brings you a lot of clarity. And for me, it's brought a lot of clarity of what our purpose is. And things that are less important to you, they kind of fall by the wayside. And what were you truly meant to become and what you're truly meant to do, I think it just, it just comes to the surface. And what I think our purpose is, is not limited to real estate. It's not even limited to travel. The reason we started this company was really to help bring people together. It was this idea of human connection. I mean, that is the root of Airbnb. It was about people literally living together in the same home. And I think that our hosts, I, wanna, I want us to do everything we can to partner with them, to help them bring people together, to get back to basics, back to bringing people together and no matter how bad things get um i'm going to tell people when they get back to the office that there will be a normal it might be a new normal and this mission is going to live on so that's what i'll tell them when we get back that's great well brian thank you so much for joining us here today it's really been great to have thank you me. and to have you answering questions from uh the linkedin community Thank you again. I just want to remind people to subscribe to the This Is Working newsletter and to follow the LinkedIn editors page. We're going live again next Tuesday, May 5th at 2 p.m. Eastern with Spanx founder Sarah Blakely. That should be really interesting. And I just want to add one data point to back up what Brian's talking about. Um, we recently looked at some data at LinkedIn that supports what Brian's saying about the blow to the recreation and travel industries. It has been one of the most impacted industries, if not the most impacted industry, with recent data showing a 22.2% decrease in month over month hiring and a nearly 20% decrease year over year. So a lot of people, uh, it's, it is hosts that are hurting here, people who have counted on this income to be able to pay their rent, to pay their mortgage, to be able to keep their homes. The entire travel industry is in real pain. Um, and I think that what you heard from Brian is really questions about what it looks like in the future, how we get through this, uh, and the struggle to try to find ways to both provide some kind of Band-Aid to be able to last until that new normal, as he talks about, kicks in, and then also to just be there and be ready for whatever that new normal looks like. So uh, good luck to everyone and, and uh, keep giving your answers and supporting each other and how you're getting through this. We'd love to hear from you. Um, thank you all for joining me here. Hope you'll join next week with Sarah Blakely and see you then.